when we talk about emotional intelligence, it's important to understand we're not only talking about being aware of other people's uh, uh, emotions, but it actually starts with being aware of your own emotions. Mm-hmm. Hello. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. <laughs> That's less enthusiastic than usual. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Today's topic. See how, how Excuse me. <laughs> emotionally intelligent I was. I was at the pickup right away. <laughs> I think I'm pretty clear about how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you have to be that intelligent or emotionally intelligent to see that. But yes, to make you feel good. Let's see if you can pick up on that later. Let me see. Let me close my eyes. (laughs) Today's topic is EQ or emotional intelligence, which is, I think most people know what it is today. I became intrigued by this idea, I think like 15 years ago. Well, it's kind of interesting how relatively new it is, the science around it is. John Gottman has been talking about it for a long time. Well, yeah. But that's how I, that's how I found it. So, so I think the the history is, um, there was the the main book by Daniel Goleman that came out, I believe, in 94, 95. Prior to that, it was mentioned a few times and and sort of the research began. There was um, a psychology professor at Yale University and then I think he became the head of Yale University, mm. Solovey, who um, who really, I think, did most of the initial research into it. But again, it's something, it's it's one of those things where, you know, 30 years ago, probably nobody heard, even heard of the term. It's interesting because Daniel Goleman, in his book, he says, you know, and this is the book he wrote now 30 years ago, he said, you know, when as I was, as I was going towards writing this book, my sense, you know, how would I be successful? How do I know if I'm successful? Was that if one day I hear two people on the street talking to each other about emotional intelligence and they understand it, they actually understand what it is, I would have been successful. But in truth, it really became a revolution where, uh, you know, so many people speak about it. It's clearly a part. It's, I, I love stories like that because it really clarifies how blind we are, you know, because this is such a foundational truth about human. Interactions. Life interactions, life success, failure, and to know that you know only thirty one years ago almost nobody knew about it. Today everybody knows about it. It's interesting. It just I've, what excites me is the fact that how many new, how many things are still out there that to be. we don't know, and five years from now, ten years from now, it'll be a revolution. Yeah, that is exciting. So, for those who aren't familiar with emotional intelligence, it's the ability to manage and understand our own and other people's emotions which some would argue is more important than IQ. What do you think? It's interesting. So I was just going back to Daniel Goldman, who again, who's sort of wrote, literally wrote the book on it. He, he, in, in, he, so he printed, the, again, the book came out, I believe, either 94, 95. And then, of course, it's been, you know, in print since then. And in the later uh, uh, versions of the book, he writes that a lot of people misunderstood. And one of the misunderstandings that he felt, felt people took from the book was the fact that they thought that emotional intelligence is more important or or definitely make somebody more successful. It's not always true, right? But the point is that it's it's it's, it's, cool. it's part of it's part of what makes a person uh, successful. It's part of what makes a relationship successful. So it's an it, my his point was it's an important uh, part of the picture, it's but of not course replacing it's not anything. it's not the total picture. So you're not going to answer the question. What was the question? Well, yeah, I mean, is it more important than IQ? I think that you depending need- for what? Both. If you want if you want <laughs> a computer, it depending on what the task at hand, right? For life in general, probably yes. But but if you have somebody who's emotionally intelligent and completely okay. not, not an idiot, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they'll be nice to hang around with, but not for too long. Emotional intelligence is to <laughs> <laughs> Emotional intelligence is to know and understand your inner world in great detail. It's not just being able to identify the milestones in your life that make up your past, but also seeing how these events and experiences have shaped you as a person and influence the choices you make. And you should know the answer to this because we've discussed this before as well. But do you is know quiz day? Yeah, I think I should ask you a question. That might really give a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the major cause of marital dissatisfaction and divorce? Major. Not being emotionally intelligent? 
Oh, no. I mean, that's part of it. But yes, I would say. But if you had to pick like one specific thing as a cause. Is this science or or idea? No, it's science. It's the birth of the first child. So what is the, sorry. So here are the statistics. Okay. 67% of couples in a newlywed study underwent a precipitous drop in marital satisfaction after their firstborn. Interesting. 33% did not experience the drop. In fact, half of the 33% experienced an improvement in their marriages. So why do you think that is? Well, first of all, clearly it's a very small percentage, though. You don't turn up about, about like 15%. But why is that? Because they were emotionally intelligent? That's going to be my answer to every question you ask. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were emotionally intelligent. These couples already had a habit of keeping up to date with each other's lives. They had a strong foundation. They knew what the trigger points were, and they knew what bothered each other. So when the experience of the stress that does come with the birth of a new child, they already knew how their partner would likely to react to things. They knew when they were stressed, they knew why, and they knew how to support each other. For these couples, the child was a great connection, like a filament and a light bulb, connecting the nodes and creating a bright glow of energy. For other couples who never had that connection, it shook everything up, and it's kind of like they experienced a short circuit. Well, that's true. So I think as we focus on on, on relationships and the importance of emotional intelligence, I think that study, that those statistics really uh, point of, to a very, very important uh, I think uh, understanding for our listeners, which is, like you said, there 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 are studies that show that to be successful in business and work, you have to have a deep and growing emotional intelligence. But it's probably impossible to be in a thriving and fulfilling relationship without a a foundation of an emotional intelligence and and its growth. So what we're saying to our listeners is that. This is not, you know, one of those lessons or understandings that, you know, I, I, you know, you, you have free will to to listen and and grow from this. This is one of those. If you want to have a good relationship, it's it's imperative, right? It's, and, and I want sorry. One more thing I just want to say is that, and I think what you said is so important because, you know, very often people, and then you you to you more than me because you deal with so many couples will come to you and say. Um, you know, everything was great before, was good before, and suddenly this happened. The reality is that the, according to the numbers that you shared, 75 percent, uh, sorry, the 85 percent of couples who wound up in a worse place after having their first child, it wasn't that everything was great before. It's just they probably, there probably wasn't that much emotional intelligence, but there was, wasn't a stressor. So they felt everything was good, but the foundation wasn't strong. Exactly. And, and, and the idea is that the, the emotional intelligence and the growth of it, and I really want to focus on, on the importance to, to really putting the time and effort into growing our emotional intelligence, um, is the foundation of any long-lasting, fulfilling relationship. And of course, also in many other areas, positive growth in other areas of life. Well, there are many couples I work with, and they are okay until there's a stress. And as soon as they unravel completely, and I always But they weren't really okay, right? They weren't okay. They were just kind of... Getting by. Going along. Exactly. So, specific to relationships, and then we'll go back, because you kind of fast-forwarded to relationships, and we'll just talk about emotional intelligence for each person. But in relationships, it's really knowing your partner's history passed before you were in the picture, right? It's knowing their, what hurts them, what upsets them, where their pain lies, because you know what happened to them in the fifth grade, or you know what kind of house they grew up in, and the things that they dealt with, and how they feel about it today. You also know current things, like, you know, on Tuesdays, they bring, you know, their favorite donuts to the office, and or you know where the bathroom is in that building, or whatever it is, because you are in each other's worlds. For couples who don't have this, they're the disengaged couple. They're a couple who any stress, anything external, anything new added to the relationship that is a point of maybe uh, conflict or stress derails them. So it's not really an option to be in a, a successful relationship and not be emotionally intelligent. It is, in fact, a main ingredient. And I would say that that should apply for friendships and family as well. Yeah, and if I can, I'd like to share again, in, as Daniel Goldman built this, not just theory, right, the, the, this idea of emotional intelligence, there's really five elements to it, which I think is important to share with our listeners. Mm-hmm. Because what I like about it is I think too, too often when people think about emotional intelligence, they think about how it, how I, my, my intelligence about your emotions, the other person's emotions in the relationship or friendship. 
But in reality, it starts, as you often say, with the individual. And therefore, when we talk about emotional intelligence, it's important to understand we're not only talking about being aware of other people's uh, uh, emotions, but it actually starts with being aware of your own emotions. Mm -hmm. If we're not really emotional intelligent with ourselves, there's no chance we'll be very good at being emotional intelligent towards others. By the way, they are not exclusive. Of course, it's possible for a person to be relatively emotionally aware of their own emotions, but not uh, invest in the time effort necessary to be able to feel and know other people's emotions. So, Daniel Goleman, in his seminal book, he said, again, there's five main areas of emotional intelligence. intelligence. One is knowing one's emotions, right? Self-awareness, recognizing a feeling as it is happening, is the keystone of emotional intelligence. So, if you want to know what the foundation of, of whether you are or are not, or I wouldn't put it in those dark terms, but whether you are growing or not growing in your emotional intelligence, it starts with you. So, just to unpack that for our listeners, that means that it, say you're going along in your day, and you're feeling good, and everything's fine, and then all of a sudden, halfway into the day, or like, you know, into the hour, you're like, well, why am I suddenly sad? You know, why am I feeling this way? And then most people kind of just say, oh, you know, I'm moody, or it's just, it's a bad day, or they write that off. I always go back and I'm like, what happened 15 minutes ago? What happened? And if I can't get it, then what happened an hour ago? What did I see? And often, like, and this happens a lot, and that's why I'm not on social media unless I just post things for work stuff. But sometimes, like, as I'm scanning it, and I only am on maybe 15 minutes a day. And I'll put a, the phone away, and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, something's bothering me. What's that? And I realize it's something that just I wasn't even paying attention to that came into my mind, my sight, you know, and affected me. So it's so important to, I mean, that's being in touch with your emotions. It's not just, oh, I, I know when I feel sad, or, or, but specifically why, right? Right. And as he says, an inability to notice our true feelings leaves us at their mercy, right? So, Unless you are aware of what of what and why you're feeling, you can make it better. But also, you just become a sad person. I remember somebody came to me for advice, and they're like, you know, I think I need to go to anger management classes. I'm just angry. I'm angry. I respond to this. I was like, you are not. You don't have rage. I'm like, you're angry because of. And then we did this exercise along the lines of you know, 15 minutes ago, and, back, and she started to practice that, and she realized she's really actually not an angry person. She just didn't know how to cope with something in her life. So, if not, my point is, if you don't learn to identify the emotion, the emotion and see what it's meant to show you, you become that emotion. And, right. and that's right. what he's exactly. saying. Exactly. And, and in his words, people with greater certainty about their feelings are better pilots of their lives. Having a surer sense of how they really feel about personal decisions, from whom to marry, to what job to take. So it's... It's very important. I, so this is the, like, as he, in his words, and it's true, the keystone. So, before we start speaking about it and thinking about how aware we are of other of others' feelings and emotions, it has to start with you. If you're not, and I would say not just um, aware, right, but that you're not growing in awareness, going ever deeper in understanding your emotions, their triggers, and and how to handle them, then everything else, meaning all the other ways in which we are meant we are we are meant to grow in our emotional intelligence, will not happen. So, I'm guessing the the second one is to learn to regulate them. Right. Ma exactly. Managing emotions. Emotional exactly. Intelligence. Han handling feelings so they are appropriate is an ability that builds on self awareness. So he uses, which I really like, you know, this, Aristotle uh, said the following, which I thought was you know a good way, especially when we think about it in a general sense, uh, managing the emotions. Anybody can become angry. He says that is easy, but to be angry with the right person and to the right degree, and at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, mm -hmm. that is not within everybody's power, and is not easy. That requires spiritual work. Right? Exactly. Right. Well, the truth is, I think, I think everything... Proactive that's why, that's yeah. why. That's why, exactly, that's why, when, as we're talking here about emotional intelligence, the foundation of it, of is course, spirituality. Is, is spirituality, which to me means a person des at least desiring to become aware of themselves, and then desiring to become a better version of themselves all the time. So, the ability to manage uh, emotions. People who are poor in this ability are constantly battling feelings of distress, while those who excel at, in it can bounce back from far more quickly from thy setbacks and upsets. So, the first is 
deepening, and I see this as a constant life's work, deepening our awareness of our emotions. Second, growing the ability, the tools um, to be able to manage our emotions. And that is the second. Third, motivating oneself. Mm -hmm. Having the, the, growing the ability to motivate ourselves. Meaning? Motivating and? Uh, marshalling emotions in the service of a goal is essential f uh, for paying attention, uh, for paying attention, for self-motivation and mastery, and for creativity. Emotional self-control, delaying gratification, and stifling impulse impulsiveness underlies accomplishment of every sort. So wasn't this just discipline? Well, you can call it it's another word for it. I think it's another cinnamon synonym. But the point a is cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamon. Did I say cinnamon <laughs> or did. cinnamon? Right. So, so being able to motivate ourselves, and I think again, a lot of people lack lack again. Let's put it different ways. All of us need to grow in our ability to motivate ourselves. Well, is he saying that if not, then any setback or failure could be the end of the pursuit? Right, or at least it will not be done uh, with the intensity that can lead to success. And we've spoken about this before: is that two people can be doing going down the same task, the same road, desiring to accomplish the same thing. One that does it with intensity and focus will much more likely achieve success than the person who does not. And unless you have the ability to create internal, consistent internal motiv uh, motivation that is able to, to you know, remove any uh, impulsivity that a person has, any distractions that come into one's life, the person will not be able to be successful. So this is the third, really, area, but I would say building block of emotional intelligence. People who have this skill to motivate themselves tend to be more highly productive and effective in whatever they undertake. Mm -hmm. So that is number three. The fourth area of emotional intel intelligence, and this is maybe I think where a lot of people think about what they think about emotional it's how intelligence. how you are with other Recognizing people. emotions in others. Yeah. Empathy, another ability that builds on emotional self-awareness, is the fundamental people skill. Yes. Really, the, and, and again, as I would say, and, and when we are talking about this, I, I cannot state this enough, we are talking about those of us who are truly want to be successful in life, I would, in other words, I would use want to be truly spiritual in life. These, these are areas that we need to be developing all the time, whether you are starting at 3 years old, 8 months old, 50 years old, 80 years old. My hope is that all of our listeners and all of us are, are in the process of developing uh, a greater and greater sense of it. Sense of so, empathy. that means being able to take social cues, to read facial expressions, to pay attention to nonverbal communication. That is all part of being empathetic and recognizing others. Right, and I would add to that, one of my um, favorite sources for this, there is a biblical story of, Mo of Moses. Most of us know Moses was really the first great leader, uh, prophet, and he became a great leader. It says in biblical story that while he, his brethren, the Israelites, were under enslaved, enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years, Moses was not, was exempt because of the tribe from which he came, from the slavery and the work. But every day he would go out, it says, and he would pay attention, he would focus on their suffering. Focusing on other people's suffering. So it's not just, like for, for example, although it's true that you have to have, you should be building the skill to really experience what other people are experiencing, right? So uh, facial cues and, 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 and other cues, that is only one part, right? So you become aware, oh, this person is uncomfortable, this person is unhappy, this person is, is, is sad. What do you do with that? I was going to say. Do you, do you work on internalizing that? Again, Moses would literally, literally do a daily meditation by going out, see one of his brethren who was being beaten or, or work, being worked hard, and he would take the time to focus on it, to meditate upon it, to make it a part of his emotional uh, experience. So I think there's two two very important elements to empathy. One is yes, how good are you, or how how again I always use the word how much more are you developing your ability to feel another person's pain or discomfort. But then, as important, how much time are you actually spending to internalize that? And if you're not doing if you're if you're doing not doing both, it'll be more difficult to grow in empathy. The key here also is to pay attention to these things and remember them so that at a later time when you want to connect to somebody or you 
you know, you have an exchange with them, you can understand where they're coming from, right? Being empathetic, paying attention to other people's emotions, hold on to that, right? Use it for for the future, for yeah. information you're going to need. Yeah, and, and in his words, people who are empathetic are more attuned to the subtle social signals that indicate what others need or want. This makes them better at callings such as the caring professions, teaching, sales, and management. But again, I think that that the foundation of this is not just the ability to see it or to to ascertain it. And then but, you have to act on it. Well, I would say first internalize it, really make it. You know, I, I know a lot of good people who who if they see somebody in pain, will 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 naturally they're naturally empathetic. They'll want to help. But we're talking about something deeper than that. We're talking about, and this is something that, that I know we aspire to, and we have to work on it all the time. And we're asking our listeners. When was the last time you actually took the time, not that it came across your life path, right? But that you actually take the time, took the time to say, wow, this person's in pain, this person is suffering, and really sit with that, internalize that. Again, not to not to diminish those who, when it crosses their life path, they'll help. That's better than those who look the other way. But that's not enough. It's not enough. It's not going to bring any one of us to the level that we're supposed to be meaning to to the manifestation of of our of our of our soul and its light as it's supposed to be unless we're actively pursuing the meditation upon the 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 thoughtfulness or upon though you know taking the time to see somebody in pain think about somebody in pain and really make it part of me it really is love your neighbor as yourself i mean truly right, right? to put yourself in somebody else's shoes feel them, and then offer, right. offer something. Right. The opposite of emotional intelligence, um, people who are low on that, they tend to be argumentative, have trouble listening, default to blaming others, and are prone to emotional outbursts. And I'm sure you can think of many people that we all know that are like that. Um, and the problem here is that it's difficult to problem solve, it's difficult to collaborate, it's hard to be in a community with somebody who just is operating on a different frequency. Absolutely. And and the fifth area of emotional intelligence, as, as uh, Daniel Goldman uh, lays it out, is handling relationships, right? The art of relationships, as it's called it, a skill in managing emotions in others. And these are the abilities that undergird popularity, leadership, and interpersonal effectiveness. People who excel in these skills do well at anything that relies on interacting smoothly with others. They are social stars. So it's hard to do that when you are dealing with somebody who lacks it with the list that I just said. I mean, it's it's right because there's not an openness. And I think, and I think, I'm curious about how we can't ask him, but how you navigate that. Well, I I I think it's a few things, but I think if we focus on ourselves, right? And I think again, this is something that that I think we all know, but none of us really knows this on a consistent basis, like you said before, why is it that people judge other people? Why is it that people get upset so easily, lash out at other people? It's because we don't put ourselves in, in somebody else's shoes, but more importantly, that it's almost impossible for us to do it. The level to which each one of us is, the word I don't want to use the word selfish, but is self-involved, and and our view of others is always, always, always based on our view of the world, our view of ourselves. And when you understand that, the, the next person is, by definition, not going to have the same world view as you, doesn't have the same history as you. So, to judge other people by our scale, be, be it the perfect scale or the worst scale, is a big problem. And and this this is again I, I I really want this is something I think about a lot and I know that I fall in this as well because again when when you see somebody doing something the only possible way you can judge whether he's being an idiot or is being an amazing person is because based on you your 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 upbringing your worldview everything everything that makes you who you are which by definition he or she does not have so to judge other people by my view. It's ridiculous, right? I'd have the only way I could. That's why it says there's a famous ancient 
teaching that says don't judge another person until you get you've to his place or you've blocked it well that's another list. way it's said but literally the verse the, the way it's said is until you are in their place and the 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 commentators explain that that means you will never be in his or her place it's it's absolutely impossible they were not born from your mother they're not born to your father they were not born in your family they did not grow up where you grew up so the thought of judging another person or even assessing another person positively or negatively um is so is so false right but what i want to say with that is that you know and i and i even in relationships right if I were you, I'd be saying to me the same things that you're saying to me. And if you were me, you'd be hearing them exactly as I am hearing them, right? But that is not almost impossible. But, but when we talk about emotional intelligence, at the deepest place, we're talking about something that's almost impossible. It has to be worked on, is my point. Anytime in a relationship, I say something that you don't like, or you say something that I don't like, there's a simple reason for that. You're you and I'm me, right? If I were you, I'd be thinking and saying exactly what you're saying, right? And if you were me, you'd be thinking and saying exactly what I'm saying. When you're, when you have a relationship, even a, 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 a coming together with another person, you have to begin with the understanding that they they have a whole life that makes them who they are. So for me to think, or even get upset about the fact that they are not behaving the way that I would have behaved, or they're not hearing what I am saying. It's well, of course, right? But I think most of us think, well, this person, he or she, is doing something terrible because uh, it's so obvious to me that they're doing. It. But yeah, it's obvious to you because of who you, where you came from. And I have this conversation often, you know, even when we look at world chaos. The first thing that people do is say that's a bad person because they're doing something that I know to be bad. But if you were born where they were born, with the family that they were born, with the education or lack of that they were born, you probably would be exactly the same person. Sure, you're talking about benefit of the doubt, you're talking about baggage we all come with, you're talking about our, where some of our past, yes, to all of that. But I feel like the way you're positioning it, it's very black and white. There are some times, whether you have somebody working for you, or you have somebody in your family, or people in your inner circle, where they are there, and and even somebody who works for you, let's say in any company, whatever, You've asked them to do something, and yeah, because of their past or because of their history, they're going to think that they know a better way to do it. But at the end of the day, if they're they're not listening, I think the problem here is that when there's judgment or there are issues of connecting with one another, yes, of course, we all see things differently. But sometimes the way things are set up, a person is meant to provide something, right? Okay, and they're not able to. And you can look at it. Well, then for, you fire. Of course, of course, there's times you should fire somebody. I'm not saying that you should never fire somebody. Of course, there are times. Or family members. Well, sometimes divorce is the right thing. I'm not saying. I'm not saying no to any children. Of that. Sometimes you know, be, uh, reprimanding Estranged. your children is the right thing. But but my my, my point is something else. That's, my point isn't that there's never time for a tough talk for for judgment. It just. I'm not saying time for judgment. I'm saying time for action because sometimes right. agree. You but can that's be not, as, you can be emotionally intelligent, but if you're dealing with somebody who is simply not capable of it, right, right. But, but that's not my point. My point is that we should go through life. You can hear him. Our dog is having a, a dream. Oh, he's dreaming. That's okay. He's it's saying okay. woof, woof. That is so cute. <laughs> woof, oh. I wonder what his dream is. Um, I think he's saying, I want Scooby Snacks. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is that we should go through life. Maybe he's listening to the conversation. Exactly. That's what it is. We should go through life with a different lens, right? That we should hear our spouse with a different ear, right? It's not that we're always, therefore, going to acquiesce, or we're always going to accept. Sorry, it's making me laugh. That's very cute, though. I hope it doesn't bother our listeners. I don't know why he wants it to be the star. It's just, it's just going through life with the different eyes and ears and thoughts about other people. And and again, I and I and again, right I, because spiritually speaking, it's about the making of you, right? It's that you will grow the skill of being emotionally intelligent. And, right, and why? And the reason it's so important is because. Again, this is something. Again, I, and I hope I'm expressing this cr- properly. We go through life with the eyes that are ours, rather than the eyes of the other, right? That we have 
a billion biases, be they positive or negative, that we come to the world with. And unless you are developing emotional intelligence, which to me, foundationally, that means, let me try to hear you as you. Ra- and let me try to see you as you, rather than try to see you in relation through, to me, through my eyes. Mm-hmm. Because then, then if you don't do that, then of course judgment is right, and and anger is right, and and so on. I think again, I, if we can again, this is this is work that I'm working on, and I hope all of our listeners are inspired to work on. This is a, a completely different way. Of, of of going through life, of interacting with others, of lo- of looking at people, and again, bring it back to relationships. One of the most, one of the biggest problems in relationships is that we are ourselves, and we are judging or thinking about our spouse or our friend or our partner in such a way that. Our expectations are that they speak and behave and think as we do. And when they fall short of that, then I'm angry. Why did you say it in that way? I would have said it differently. Yes, of course, I would have said it differently. I'm a different person than you. But give give the grace, right, uh, that comes from knowing, of course, that's going to be their view. And that creates an opening for connection, exactly. which is ultimately where we want exactly. to go. And if I can share this, uh, which I thought was so, you know, there's a famous... Oh, I I couldn't even get a word. I couldn't say yes or no. It I'm did. sorry. Was I not being emotionally intelligent? You see. I mean. <laughs> okay. Before you get on to the next, next point, up, yes. <laughs> I would just like our listeners, because yes. we'd like to involve them also today, Michael, <laughs> to see if they are emotionally intelligent. So ask yourself the following questions to see where you are at. Can you control your anger? Do you take accountability for your actions? Are you honest with the people in your life? By the way, there's so many people who are not honest with themselves. I just see that as a major. Let's be careful with that. And explain what you mean by being honest. It doesn't mean by telling your truth. No, it just means by being honest. But first and foremost, with yourself, with where you're at in life, what you think, what motivates you, what directs you, and then allowing yourself to authentically show up in relationships. That's what I mean. Authentically. Yes. Do you generally trust others? Oh, I had a good one to share about that, but I won't. Sure. What? No, no, no. You liar. Uh, <laughs> Do you feel comfortable? Liar. That's a very strong word. Our listeners are going to get the wrong idea. No, they won't. <laughs> Do you feel comfortable communicating with others about sensitive topics? And are you able to make tough decisions thoughtfully? So those are really key ways to know where you are in terms of being emotionally intelligent. I did want to say one other thing Please about something else, though, so I'll let no, you no, take no, a turn. Absolutely not. No, you brought up one of the five points about being able to regulate your emotions. I think that was number two. Do you remember when our kids, well, one of them, two of them had what they called a nene? Yes. Which was their pacifier. And for others, it's a blankie or a, a snuggle bunny or whatever. You have some have kind such of. That's a good story to share, but I'm going to hold you're, it. You're so <laughs> lying. And then you're going to make people think that I stopped no, no, you from no, saying no, no. something that you're going to say. Gonna really? What were you going to say? No, no. Very good. Restrictions, good. Exactly. I'm regulating my emotions. Uh huh. So children will often keep a beloved object, a stuffed animal, something around that provides them comfort. So the nene would help them transition to sleep, or if we left the house, or when they went to in the car ride on the way to school because it was a big change, right? It was something that they felt that they needed to help them feel a little bit less anxious. So if you think about it, right? Children do that, and they do that naturally. They go to an object or something. And the way I see it is that they're growing their emotional intelligence about that they have a feeling and then they're finding something that's going to help them feel better. And I just think that we should all kind of look at ourselves, even as adults, what are the things that we do to create that for ourselves? So for instance, I've learned to know like my schedule's packed. I know if I make my schedule look a certain way, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm not really going to want to talk to anybody or I'm going to feel like I need space just from just to to not have any talk, right? So I've learned how to space that out or I'll go, I'll do a cold plunge or a hike or if I'm feeling really stressed, I'll dance. Like I found a way to comfort and soothe my own feelings and emotions. So I think that's a really big part of it. I think very often people kind of just 
go through, they barrel through emotions and, oh, I just, if I can make it to Friday, you know, and then what happens Friday, then we overindulge perhaps with too much sugar or too much alcohol or whatever it is or not enough sleep because now we just want to have fun because, so it's important to see where you're at in these things and how is it that you're able to self-soothe and um, regulate your emotions? Yeah. I think, like you said, you were saying before that in relationships, being authentic, right? And I think, and I, you again, you you more than I have dealt with uh, couples where the the and I think it's one of your greatest skills really where the communications break down, and to start giving the I, I have to, I shared this with you a few weeks ago when I heard you uh, uh, talking to a couple that you have this ability to be able to really know what they're saying and why there's the problems being created by communication that they think well but. I'm, you know, I'm just sharing what I'm feeling right now. And you are able to unpack that for them and really... Um... Well, funnily enough, this one couple I worked with for uh, 14 years on and off, because they were married, they got divorced, they got back together. Anyway, they were having an argument and I was on the call with them and they were talking about this argument. And at one point I was just like, I, I just don't understand why this is just... Like you, you both are shocked on how to respond to one another. I can tell you exactly why he did what he did and what he really wanted. And I can say why you responded the way you did and what you really wanted to say, because I've been paying attention for the last 14 years. Like you have all the information exactly, exactly. you need. You can be, I am emotionally intelligent with both <laughs> of you because I've been really focusing on that. But it's funny because then in relationships, ego is like, no, exactly. I don't want to be emotionally intelligent. Right. So there's a famous psychologist, Chaim Gnat, um, who's sort of seen as the grandfather of, of emotional com- and effective communication. And he recommended a simple, but I think it's such a powerful formula, even just for our listeners to, to start using. For So he says that the formula for a complaint is X, Y, Z. Simply put, you sh- the right way to complain would be, when you did X, it I made felt. me feel Y, and I'd rather you did Z instead. How sim- how amazing is that? Baby, Nobody, baby, people, baby. Yeah. is that not what I? When yeah, I that's what you that? do. But I'm saying, but I think I love <laughs> I love the fact that he used again. This is you know, you know, probably fifty or sixty I did years that ago. On yes, Monday yes. was it? No, Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, this is for our listeners, not for me. X Y Z, right? And uh, for instance, he to gives your an example. Credit, you did hear me when he didn't call me. You were going that you were going to be late for dinner. I felt underappreciated and angry. I wish you would have called to let me know you'd be late instead of you're a thoughtless, self centered bastard. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> which is right, uh, which is how the issue is all too often put in couples' fights. In short, open communication has no bullying, threats, or insults. But I really think, again, I, what I liked about it is that, that no, it's a really simple just formula. remember XYZ, right? Now, I, would, I don't know what the percentage when is. When you, I felt next time. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wish, right? Uh, when Although you did I wish, X, it would just be like, I felt time, Y, I, I wish you would have done Z. Yeah. Which I think, again, and this is, again, this, one of the reasons why emotional intelligence is so important, because it literally, literally is at the foundation of why things break apart in relationships, in work, in life. Mm-hmm. So, for our listeners, how do, we cov- how do we cultivate emotional intelligence? I would say do less of this, less of criticizing others less of criticizing yourself. And a big one, which we didn't touch upon, is unrealistic expectations. This is a big one in all relationships. A mantra that I've lived with for a long time is, if you don't appoint, you won't be disappointed. There's a Buddhist saying that goes, peace begins when expectations end. So basically, they're dangerous, where usually they're never met. Sometimes they're not even fair, the ask. It's just complicated. So really check yourself. What is it that you expect? from whom and why. And when we remove the expectation, we allow people just to give freely or show up as they do, it's going to be clear of what you take from the relationship, what you don't. It's much less complicated. So I hope that we have inspired our listeners to really invest the time and effort in becoming more and more, ever more, emotionally intelligent for themselves, for others. Because this is one of the most important areas by which we can make all of our relationships and life really grow and thrive. And remember, you, along with the rest of us, if you said, are a sum of our past. We come with our baggage. We come with negative belief systems, thoughts that don't serve us. So imagine, like, you know, how can you actually have a successful relationship or communication if you don't fully know yourself? So, again, the first step is, you know, learn to really 
love you, understand you, become really intelligent there. And then from that space, with that strength, find it in others. Absolutely. So, it's a great time to remind our listeners to send your emails, questions, stories, inspirations, topic ideas to Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life, Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Your emails inspire us, they inspire our listeners. Also go to Apple Podcasts, write five star, give us five stars, give five star reviews, share this podcast with everybody you know. And as always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry and emotionally intelligent. <laughs>